So this is me, I'm Stephen McCarthy, I'm head of design here at GDS. Um, so as you pro if you've been here for a while, as you likely know, design for UK public sector has a long and celebrated history. So today I'm going to give you a bit of a talk about this history and how we're proudly building on it and hopefully kind of inspire you. And these kind of, you know, these hard times working in government, but how we're building on this legacy of really good public sector design. Um, and as I mentioned, you'll probably know a lot of this stuff if you've been in GDS for a while. We talk about it quite often, but it's good to get a bit of a, a bit of a review of this really inspiring work of the past. But when you think of great grit British design, especially from like an, an outward person looking in, Mostly it's product design that we think of. We think of things like Sir Giles, uh, Gilbert Scott's red telephone boxes, as you can see here. They're a classic example of iconic kind of global design. Other famous things from the UK you often think of are like the double-decker bus, the black taxi, the red post box, the Spitfire plane, things like that. But I'm here to talk about the less kind of tourist famous work, but just as important work. Um, so something we often talk about is this. So in the late 50s and early 60s, Margaret Calvert and Jock Kinnear, pictured here, uh, designed the UK road signage system. Um, it was the first standardised system of its kind and was needed due to the new motorway system that was being built at the time. The old signage across British towns and roads used to be a mismatch of, you know, very different designs. It wasn't very coherent and it was hard for users to understand as well. And this was going to become a bigger, bigger problem as more and more roads were built and more cars were on the road. Um, the system that they built has pretty much been copied throughout the world. It's kind of pretty much ubiquitous to us now when we look at it, especially when we, I mean, we see it here and we see similar things when we go around Europe and, and anywhere else. Um, this is Margaret here as well, and interestingly, Margaret also acted as a consultant throughout the early stages of the WK Alpha. Um, I've been at GDS over seven years now, and I remember in the office way back then. And an interesting fact, which a lot of you will know, but some of you probably won't, is you may recognise this typeface. So this is the typeface called Transport, and it's used on the road signs. It was designed by Margaret Calvert back in the late 50s, and it's the typeface we use on GovUK. A slightly updated, redrawn ver version that was worked on by Margaret and uh, a type designer called Henrik Kubel. But it's a good uh, look back on history, and the, the font still, or the typeface still works extremely well for... Uh, for its revamped digital version. Um, so here's the transport minister at the time, Ernest Marples, the guy in the middle pointing at things, um, opening the first stretch of the M1 motorway back in 1959. And I, we think this is probably the first public reveal of the new typeface and system. Um, so interestingly, there's a lot of overlaps to the way Margaret and her team worked back then to the way we work now. Uh, so, they did lots of research to make sure the typeface was readable on roads while moving at high speeds. Um, just like now, the implementation included a lot of prototyping and a lot of user testing with users in real conditions. <laughs> <laughs> in their case, um, obviously they're mostly concerned with legibility and here as you can see from this uh, funny participation image, they were trying to read a sign from afar and then marking down how, how clearly they could read it and what they were reading. Um, and like us as well, they were goal-oriented. Um, and all the work they did, the, go the goal was, was, was clear functionality, like it was much more function over any kind of decor, stripping things back to their bare bones to make them work for the user. Um, here's a really good quote from Jock Kinnear. Um, I'll read it out for those who probably can't see it. <laughs> So the last thing you want to do when you're driving at 77 miles per hour is look at that lovely L or T. All you want to do is be told where you are and, when to, and where to turn. The key is not noticing it. When you're designing a typeface for signage, you know you have done well with no one comments on it. If we were to slightly revamp that quote for the work we're doing today, you don't really have to change much. All you want to do is be told where you are and where you turn. The key is not noticing it. When you're designing, a product or service, you know you've done it with no one comments on You know you've done well with no one comments on it. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of the of the road signage system. To move on to another kind of iconic design, another actually British-led transport design innovation. Let's talk about tube maps. So this is the original tube map. Um, it looks probably very different to the one we know today. And then. This is Harry Beck's first tube map sketch from 1931, adopted by London Underground in 1933. 
here's a slightly updated version that was adopted. Um, and what was just, this was just, uh, my, when we look at it now again, like to use this word ubiquitous, we just take this kind of stuff for granted. But back then this was totally innovative and totally groundbreaking in terms of map design, especially for getting people around complex systems, in this case the London Underground. Um, and why this is better than the previous plan, which was here, is that users don't really need geographic representation. They need the sequence of stuff showing where the junctions are. And this was really forward thinking. And the old design, if this wasn't done this way, especially today with the numerous overlaps of stations, as you see the kind of complex London underground maps, it would have been a complete mess with so many stations near the overlapping each other and stuff like that. It would have been really, really hard to understand. And this is Harry here. Uh, and interesting, Harry wasn't a designer in title, but he was a technical draftsman. But just like the road signs, this map style has been copied throughout the world by city transport systems. And again, it all started here. Another example, kind of moving away from transport per se, is Joseph Baselgate. He not only helped resolve the great stink in London during the 19th century as the chief engineer of London's Metropolitan Board of Works, but in the process of overseeing the engineering of the new London sewage system, he helped implement the system that is still in use today, <coughs> amazingly. And his foresight in defining, defining the diameter of the sewers was, was really forward-thinking and remarkable. So when planning the network, he took the densest population, gave every person the most generous allowance of sewage production, funnily enough, and uh, came up with a diameter pipe that was needed. He then said, well, we're only going to do this once. It's going to be very expensive, and there's always the unforeseen. So what he did was he doubled the diameter to be used based on what he thought was a very generous initial scope. Anyway, and what, what's, what, the reason this is really, really, really like brilliant is because his foresight has allowed for the un unforeseen increase in population density with the, with the introduction of things like terror blocks around London. Um, with the original smaller pipe that was proposed, um, we re they reckon London would have overflowed in the 1960s probably, uh, rather than coping until the present day as it has. Lots of information on this, uh, uh, this work can be seen at the Museum of London if you're interested. Um, and here's a really interesting image of, interesting image of them, the building, the actual sewage system. And as I mentioned earlier, it was a massive investment. We, they reckon today it would cost about probably a billion pounds in today's money. Um, so he wanted to get it right from the start, and that's why he doubled the diameter, as I mentioned. Uh, by the time he died in 1891, the population was about five and a half million in, uh, people defecating in inner London. Um, <laughs> over double the number of when he first designed the sewers in the 1850s, so he was right with his choice. Um, and like, kind of his recipe basically was to respond to future demand, today's extreme user needs, and then multiply by two. And this can kind of, you know, might uh, kind of resonate with some developers when they're looking at things like load testing and stuff like that. Um, but you know, they were thinking of along those lines way back then. Uh, onto another really iconic project. So this group of, unfortunately, mostly men, but there is some women there, um, is an organisation called uh, Design Research Union, and I work for British Rail you might know of. Um, this iconic identity is still in use today. Uh, so Design Research Unit were a group of designers and architects established in around the late 40s and are famous for their public sector work. And one of those pieces is this, the iconic identity for British Rail. Um, so using the power of graph design to make something work better for the user, uh, they made a very complicated system more legible and understandable. I'm just going to flick through some examples here. So again, using simple, clear typography and functional graphics, just like the road signs I showed earlier, uh, they made the complicated rail system much easier to navigate for users. Um, if you're interested, a few years ago, there was a Kickstarter campaign to republish the identity guidelines. It has like tons and tons of nerdy information about the identity system if you want to buy it and check it out. I think it's around 60 quid or something like that. But it's, 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 worth, a, it's worth a gander if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, so the stuff I've been showing you is like public sector design, used to be mostly big physical infrastructure projects. Um, today it's more likely to be the design of services. So looking back again on our history of a really important piece of service design, let's look at the National Health Service. Introduced in 
1948 after the Second World War, is still one of the great examples of good service design in modern Britain. Its original material shows clearly what the proposition was. Um, here's some of the very early day leaflets they created way back then. So on the left you can see the leaflet that was delivered to all homes in the UK back in 1948. And on the right is an ad published in newspapers. I'm going to read the snippet from the ad here because you probably can't see it. So, quote, your new National Health Service, anyone can use it, men, women and children. There are no age limits and no fees to pay. You can use any part of it or all of it as you wish. Your right to use the National Health Service does not depend upon any weekly meetings. Or sorry, any weekly payments. Meetings. <laughs> I'm just back from holiday, there's already about 50 meetings in my calendar, so... Um, here's some uh, snippets from an accompanying video that they uh, released to, with the launch of the health service and the leaflet. Um, if you check it, I can give you the link afterwards, it's on YouTube, but it's a uh, it's really good like um, overview of the kind of uh, information points that they, they used when they launched the health service and it goes into, you know, some old school acting going, oh this is really interesting reading through the, uh, reading through the leaflet, but it's worth it. It's worth a view if you have some time today. It's about forming a long video, so I'm not going to show it here because we're going to run out of time. But anyway, so to sum up, design and public service today means building on this great heritage that we have. And to be honest, we don't tell, say this to ourselves enough. We're doing a pretty good job at it. Um, at least our peers think so. We've won numerous awards over the years. And actually, probably like, more importantly than winning awards is like the road signs and shoe map. The work we're doing here is being used around the world. And that's like, you know, over the last six or seven years, there's numerous examples of this. One of the most recent ones was uh, New Zealand government taking a, a full on reuse of WK Notify, which is all this stuff is really, really important to see because it makes us here, we're world leading in the work that we're doing. And by we, I don't mean just the design team, I mean all of us. Uh, thanks, that's me.